Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yi Chao, and my presentation is about long-term sea, for sea forecasting for all species in Trondo ravines. So when we talk about nature, the first thing really jumped into my mind is the trees. And as you walk down the road and look around, I believe you appreciate the ecological services that trees gave us. We humans are freely getting ecological services from trees every day, and we all benefit from it. When you look up a tree, you'll notice that bird nests or other small mammals like squirrels up there. Squirrels eat nuts from the trees, and birds always landing on the tree looking for insects. And uh, our forests, which consists of trees, are also habitat for other mammals like deer. So we can say tree is the thing that brings biodiversity together. Uh, other examples of the services that trees can give us is trees is good, tree is good for our air quality. Trees can purify air. They take up air pollutants from the air, thus reduce the concentration of the air pollutants. This is a research from University of Wollongong. The most neat part about this research is, as it says, people who live in the areas with more trees are, have better mental and general health. So that means trees can provide services even go beyond the material things. Um, however, the world is facing a declining of forest cover right now. Trees are gone because of um, human harvesting or natural disturbance like wildfire, wind, or outbreaks of insects. So that makes every part of the world want to bring the forest back, want to restore their forest. And city of the city of Toronto has been working toward the goal of 40% canopy cover for years, but the current canopy cover in Toronto is only around 27%, which is still far from the target. And when we talk about the canopy cover, you gotta be careful. You gotta be careful what are these 40% consists of. That means what makes up, what species makes up those 40%. Are they native species or are they non-native species? Because historically, people are only talk about the canopy cover. They only care about how to reach the 40% goal, but they don't talk about native versus non-native. And actually, this is what, the, what our city done in the last, last century. Uh, the city increased their canopy cover to 27% by planting only this one species, Norway maple, which is non-native non invasive species from Europe. The reason why city choose this species is because they grow fast. But once they established, they can create a thick canopy that does, does block the sunlight and restricting the growth of native species. So what's the consequence right now? 25% of street trees and up to 50% of the trees in the Toronto ravines are consist of this species, now in maple. So imagine what will happen if we do nothing on this our city will become a green desert. And uh, you've, also, you've been already seeing this, this chart from the previous presenter who was also my colleague, Jerome, this summer. And again, as you can see there, um, in Toronto, only 43%, well, only 43 out of 115 uh, tree species are native. That's also 30 less than the uh, Toronto original 73 native species. So when we all appreciate the diversity, the ecological services that trees bring to us, but the fact is we are losing this native stuff. That means we need to do something. Actions are needed to, to maintain and increase the number of native species that can cope with the overabundance of non-native species and help to reach a 40% canopy cover goal is needed. And how can you do that? Um, the most direct way to increase native canopy cover is to plant more native trees. And that means we need tons of native seeds. The reason why I say tons of is that um, when we're talking about planting trees, let's say if you have 100 seeds, that doesn't mean you will get 100 trees. You need to consider the seed mortality here. Um, so if we want to reach a 40% canopy cover goal, that means we need way more than number of seeds that we sought. Uh, and, and we should not just plant any seeds, even its native species. Um, 
because many native, native seeds are not of local prominence and have instead been planted aside far from Toronto and may not be best suited to the local environment. Therefore, it is assumed that um, actually the better idea is to plant these seeds from old local trees because all lo because long lived or trees of local prominence have survived many environmental problems. Therefore, it is assumed that um, they are better adapted to the local environment, and uh, in turn, the local biodiversity is also adapted to them. So, so that brings our project. Our project, our project started by Eric Davis with, um, since 2016, and we are now in the fourth year. We've been looking for and mapping out those uh, native species DBH greater than 50 centimeters in Toronto ravines, and we also did the sea forecasting for each individual every summer. Um, the reason why we choose DBH greater than 50 is that our goal, as I mentioned earlier, is to find those long-lived native trees. But in the field, we have no way to accurately determine the age of a tree. So we assume that a tree with larger DBH is more likely to be a long-lived tree. Um, and these are the rings that, that, that our team worked this summer. Uh, as you can see there, there are 14 ravines there. And from the westmost Cedar River Ravine to eastmost E.T. Sandton Park and Sunnybrook, that's all our study sites. Um, and Evergreen Brickworks, which was our research partner this summer, um, are also one of the 14th. And uh, as you can see, it's located in the heart of the area. So as my colleague Jerome was focused on the species, species recent, richness site, uh, the basic things that I looked at were those four questions. Who, how much, where, and when. Who equals priority? There are 73 native species in Toronto. Which species should I focus on first? And how much seeds does an individual tree has? Where can we get those trees? Or where, where can we get those seeds? and do the same in terms of seed production. Lastly, when does seeds get mature and ready to be collected? We don't know the, the answer of these questions because there are no actual data out there. So, so this table, I used this table again, which is from the previous, previous presenter, and you already know this is a species priority rank table. Um, from this table, we can get the answer of the first question, who? As you can see there, uh, red oak is in medium priority, which is in, which, which is in yellow, and white oak and bur oak is in high priority. So for my capstone, I started on these three oak species uh, since they are all the first one that we need to focus on. Um, and, and besides, oak is one of the most important species in Northern Hemisphere, and uh, even, it's the, even it's one of the most studied trees in the world, but still very little know about them in terms of sea biology. The fact is, there's very little scientific research on oaks in local level. The only study that you can find of Ontario is this paper, and it was published 24 years ago by day. And it was also done up north Pembroke, it's not even from Toronto. Plus, it, it is only on red oak. In terms of practical, the only information that we have is this seed manual, which was produced by Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, and it's also on provincial level. So right now, we are lack of information in terms of local level. So asking yourself a question, uh, why can we have a seeds of Toronto trees and shrubs? And actually, that's, that's what we are doing right now. We want to localize the information. We want to localize it. So. That's part of what we did. That's part of the results of tree mapping. Um, and that's only for oak species, the, the three oak species. Uh, so you can see there, right now, uh, there are 424 red oaks there, 73 white oak, and uh, 17 bur oaks out there on our tree map. Uh, so as you can see, the majority is red oak. Red, white oak is not too bad, but compared to red oak, this is a small number, and there are only few brokes out there. Um, not only the number of each oak species may be very uneven, the number of oaks in each ravine was also different. So for example, Edwards Gardens, there are only two oaks there in terms of larger tree, and they are all red oak. 
So this is similar result from the previous slide. The pie charts here are the percentage of number of different oak species in different ravines. The red color means red oak, green means white oak, and the uh, blue means bur oak. The idea here is, again, not every ravine is different. Some places like Edward Gardens and uh, Burke Brook Ravine, the only oak species they have in terms of large tree is red oak, and they, they don't have bur oaks and white oaks. Um, and again, you can see that red oak accounts for the majority. Um, there are only white oak accounts little, but still have few. Uh, you can barely see blue there, which is bur oak. So in terms of sea forecasting, since red oak is everywhere, that allows us to study the effect of uh, geographic location on sea proactivity. So as, ma as I mentioned earlier, we also did sea forecasting for each individual oaks. This photo here just show you how I did sea forecasting. I use binoculars to observe the crown of the tree from three different directions, and for each direction, I randomly choose one terminal branch to count the number of acorns. And uh, to be honest, sometimes it was really bothering to use binoculars because you know you need to look up for several minutes just because you know some the most long-lived trees were so tall that the acorns are hard to see, and especially for some close, close canopy area, you cannot even see the crown of the tree. And also wind, rain, and other weather conditions could also affect my observation. Um, after I collected data, I averaged the three observation data for each individual, so that each individual would end, end up with only one C forecasting value. For example here, let's say if the three, if the three observation data of a tree is four, five, and six, then the final C forecasting value will be five. Um, this is just the basic result of our C forecasting this year. Uh, this year was really bad year for white oak and bur oak. Both white oak and bur oaks experienced crop failures this year. Uh, we didn't even find a single echo from white oak, and we didn't. Uh, yeah, but luckily this year was a really good year for red oak. So for this C forecasting part. Since none of the white oaks had acorns and there are only few red oaks, a few bur oaks out there, I'm gonna focus more on the red oak. Like I mentioned before, I averaged three observation data for each individual oak, and each individual ended, ended up with only one C forecasting value. And then I made this histogram uh, for all the red oaks that we forecasted. Um, then I divided the result into four standards zero, low, medium, and high. And the images on the left just give you the basic, basic idea how low production looks like, and the pictures on the right just show you how high it looks like. Okay, this is a detailed information of sea forecasting data of red oak. There are 424 red oaks in our, on our tree map, but as you can see, only 341 red oaks with data. The reason for that is because, like I said earlier, there are some trees um, were in the close canopy area, so I was not able to see the canopy and uh, thus there was no data for them. Uh, of the 341 individuals with data, only 53 were not observed to produce seeds, and more than half of the individual um, has seed use of at least medium or high. Actually, as you can see there, um, the number of low, medium, high are pretty close. Um, this tells us not every individual is the same in terms of C forecasting. Um, trees are different, so that brings new questions. Um, is, this, is that driven by geography, or are all those low and high C production trees in the same ravines? Um, that's the answer. Uh, this is pretty much pretty similar map from the previous one, but it gives us different information. These pie charts here are the percentage of number of trees in different standards. So we can see, again, every ravine is different. We don't know why. We don't know what causes these geographic differences, but what we know is that what we know, know is the result, um, and we know what it tells us. Some ravine, for example, Cedar River Ravine and Velvoka. More than half of the individuals there 
had no seats this year. And Edward's Garden, I heard it from others. Edward's Garden, uh, they decide to spend millions of dollars to restore their forest. But they don't have seed source, actually, as you can see there. So where do they get seeds? Maybe other places like Sunnybrook, I don't know. One of our biggest funding this summer is the timing of seed collection. Again, this menu is from Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources. And as you can, as it says on this cover, this is a field menu for crop forecasting and collecting. So if you go, go check this book, you will find this table. This is a seed planner table for red oak. The yellow here means flowering time, the red means best seed forecasting time, and the green means best seed collecting time. The most important part is, uh, is the green part, because that's the time when the acorns get mature. And that gave us more straightforward information for stream, more, more straightforward information about when to collect seeds. And you can see there, the best seed collecting, collecting time for red oak starts from mid-September and ends on late November. However, based on our actual observation, we found that the seeds of oak, red oak matured one and, one and a half months earlier than indicated in the seed menu. So if you want to collect seeds, and you go check the seed menu, which is our provincial guideline, and the, the book tell you, hey, go, see, go, go find seeds on September, then you wait until September, what will happen? The seeds are already gone. Um, and this is not, about, not only about earlier, it's also about shorter, and that's gonna affect natural regeneration. As you can see there, acorns started getting mature and ring down on early August, and this ends on late August, uh, which is also shorter than indicated in the seed menu. And if, it, if the seeds drop down on August, which is also, uh, and, and if the seeds get ring down on August, what will happen again? The seeds may get rot because the weather on August was so hot. Um, so this tells us for those things that are important. We think we, we know a lot about them, but the fact is what we know is not always true. It could be wrong just like that. Um, I'm not saying the information from the C menu is nonsense. Um, maybe maybe it's, it, it's right for other places in Ontario. Maybe it's right 10 years ago, but what I know is that Toronto is different right now. So that makes monetary acorn protection extremely important in our project. All the data that we collected and will be collected, helping the seeds be targeted. So here, and bring back those four questions, when, or who, how much, where, and when. Now we can answer these four questions. Um, who? What we want to bring back is native species, and we should focus on the, these um, high priority ones, ones. In this presentation for my capstone, I just focus on oak species, and there are other native species need to be started. The second question: How much? According to our result, see production varies from individual to individual, and also the third question: see availability varies from location to location. Lastly, which is the most important one? We found that in Toronto, acorns get mature on August, which is one and a half months earlier than our provincial guideline. Um, and, and this summer, as mentioned earlier, we also work with Evergreen Brief Works. Uh, I really appreciate the help that they gave us, and we also helped them to map out the large trees around their area and create, created their own tree map. By giving them the data that we collected to help them restore their forest really makes our works more meaningful. And hopefully our work could help more places like Evergreen. Thank you. Jay. I was just curious, so you have a snapshot in time for, um, for yeah. your seed work um, just from this past summer. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, have you looked into the literature at all um, 
Well, a couple of questions or a couple of issues. One is like, um, what is the what is the difference among individuals? So some trees, how synchronous is the fruiting? Is what I'm asking. So some trees uh, may be in, asynchronous with others. I don't know the pattern of synchrony in the population, like how how um, common mast fruiting is. Um, so is the idea that some ravines don't have any seeds this year, does that reflective of next year? So that's one question. The other question is, any given year is weird. If you spend enough time out in the forest, every year <laughs> seems weird from some perspective. And 2019 was certainly a weird year in a lot of ways. It had a really cold late spring. Um, so I'm wondering, again, from the literature or whatever, how much evidence is there even for oak for example, that the pattern of the timing of phenological events varies a lot from one year to the next. That's actually, that's one of the research gap. Um, what, what we can find on the papers doesn't mean that Toronto is the same. You know what I mean? That's, that's why we need to go out to get this actual data. And, and as I said, we are only on the fourth year. so. So we need to spend more and more time to monitoring the acorn productions and other, other seed, production, seed productions for other species. No, but what I'm saying is yeah. one year for one species is not nearly enough. Because yeah, I know, I know, because I'm the only one to do this. So that the point is even one species requires one person that much time. and. Uh, so what about 73 native species? Maybe you need 73 MLCs to do this. <laughs> I don't know. So that's why this is important. Is, is yeah. more important. If you're going to do this next year, uh -huh. let's say, uh -huh. would you do right up again? Or would you do another species? We should. We should do that again. That makes it important. So um, this question comes out of concern for your neck, doing all that looking up. Um, I was curious just if there was any consideration of maybe in the future using like drone technology to um, maybe also get some more accurate data. Good idea, because just like I mentioned, binoculars really bother. And actually, this summer, I also visited the Mesoga Golf Country Club. And what they were doing that they actually use drone. And yeah, it, it, it's, it is way more better than the binoculars, but also brings some new questions, like the battery. Because sometimes we need to spend a whole day in ravines, but normally, as far as I know, a drone, drone's battery can only last for like 30 minutes, so that may be another question. And also, our project, we don't have funds anywhere. We don't have funds from anywhere. Yeah, so only one binoculars can cost us hundreds of dollars. So I don't know drone, yeah. I have a question. So it seems like the uh, the white oak and the bur oak are at more of a risk uh, in that they're not producing. Sorry, I can't hear. You can't hear? Okay. How's that? Yeah. It seems like the white oak and the bur oak have are yeah. more at risk than the red oak. So because they're not producing seeds, is that correct? You mean in terms of the number of individuals or the seed forecast? It, as far as regeneration and uh, seed collection. Um, and I, I'm, I'm wondering where you go from here. If the trees aren't producing seeds, what's our next step? What do you do? Because this is only the data for this year, for this summer. But that doesn't mean this species uh, uh, have no seeds every year. Uh, actually, when you look at the research paper, um, they only mention, for example, they mentioned that red oaks have good seed crops years, maybe uh, two to five years, but the question is, what what exactly the number of the years? Two years, three years, or four years? I don't know. We don't know. So, also for white oaks, burrows, actually, 2016, which is the first year of our project, there are tons of seeds of white oaks out there. So that means not every year is bad year. So that's the reason why we do this. We need to monitor the acorn production so that we maybe we can get patterns in the future. That's that helps the C strategy. Yeah. Um, I believe you go first. Sorry. 
thank you. That was great. Uh, it's good to see um, the support of it's. I work with the main lines. I'm an outdoor educator at Evergreen, so it's great to kind of see the, the science that we do on a regular basis with kids and adults. Uh, one question I do have is, when you were looking at the populations, did you look at what trees were surrounding those populations and did the variety of trees have impacts on the populations? Um, what's, sorry, what, what do you mean? What I'm asking is the trees that weren't producing seeds this year, yeah. what other species were around them and do you think that they had any impact on, on the lack of, of seeds? Um, it depends because actually we don't really dig into, dig in, in, dig into these your questions, but um, yeah, uh, sorry, I don't know this. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Hi. So different tree species grow at different rates, and then they will also start to senesce at different periods in their life. So I'm wondering if you think the 50 centimeter DBH threshold for a, a heritage tree or a big seed mass producing tree, it should be the same for every tree species? That's what we did. Um, because like I said, it's, there's no way to determine the age. So we, we just assume that 50 centimeters is enough. Maybe, maybe, maybe in the future, other people will develop, develop some better methods to determine the age. Then, then maybe it's, it's better, yeah. There may be tree species where 50 centimeters is too yeah. big. And at that point, they're no longer going to be good seed producing trees. Too, too what? Too big. Too big. Why? Too old. Too old. So, so that, that's, the, that's what we did. We monitored them and we find the patterns of them for each individual. Yeah, that's what we did. Any more questions? No. Um, um, two questions. Uh, in Lee's side, I know that there are extensive areas that are like Norway maple monocultures, and I think maybe that Erncliff Park is, is that an example of. I wonder if these areas could be maybe mapped and could maybe recommend in the future there be sort of a test plot to correct that problem. Also, regarding Oak trees, I know that this, like Don Valley floodplain, there's certain, you know, oaks that will thrive in floodplain, like uh, the pin oak, uh, white oak, swamp white oak. I wonder if they could maybe be encouraged in situations like that. Um, I, don't, I don't really know that. <laughs> Uh, the question: What was the question of whether lowland oaks could be encouraged to grow elsewhere, up yeah, upland? Yeah, the Don, Don Valley, the oaks that thrive in, in you know wetland situations, swamp, forests, that sort of thing. Uh huh. Got a you know valley there, presumably flooding will take place. In right. Different sort of species. Yeah. I don't know if you, so the question was, is there, could you promote lowland oak species uh, in the lowlands, um, like around the, the brickworks? Yeah, for I sure. Know. Yeah? Maybe. I, I, I don't know either, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, maybe. Uh, any, no more questions? All right, um, we'll move on. Thank you.